Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Pitsuk. Um, he's currently a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard in their systems group. Um, he previously uh, got his PhD um, in Cambridge at the, um, where, at the uh, <laughs> computer laboratory. I'm sorry, at the, yeah, there, yes, at the Cambridge Computer Lab, um, where he was working on event-based uh, middleware architectures. And some of his other interests are in uh, generally in large-scale distributed systems and in stream-based um, overlay networks, which is what we'll be hearing about today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so in this talk, I would like to talk about my work that I did at Harvard as a postdoc, which is mainly on um, the placement of processing services in an overlay network for um, um, stream-based data processing applications. Um, I'll, I'll briefly mention some of the previous work that I also that I did during my PhD at Cambridge and how it sort of fits together in, with with what I'm doing now. So, so the motivation for this work is that. Um, at, at Harvard, we have a very active sensor networks group, and they are thinking about all those cool um, new applications that we can do with sensor networks. Um, so one thing that we're doing is um, volcano monitoring. Um, so um, last year, we had a couple of, of people going down to Ecuador, and they actually deployed a network of modes around an active volcano um, to sample um, low-frequency infrasound at that volcano. And it turns out this is a way to um, figure out more about the physical internal structure of the volcano. Um, so all of those sensor network deployments have a common problem. So eventually they need to get the data from the sensor network to the users. And here in this example, the users are actually researchers at the University of New Hampshire um, who we, we were collaborating with, and they are interested in getting those, those sensor network readings. So, um, so the way it's done at the moment is that once the data um, gets to a particular base station at the sensor network. It is then logged, there is a storage device, and every now and then someone has to actually go up to the mountain, get, fetch the storage device, and then physically transport it to, to, to people. But what would be much nicer if we had, for example, a satellite uplink from the base station, and we could then stream the, da the data in real time to researchers that can, for example, um, express their data needs in, 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 in the form of queries. So, th so this is sort of the the kind of vision that we have is that we provide this infrastructure that any types of sense network researchers can then use um, to um, leverage the resources of multiple sensor network deployments, perform um, data fusion, and collaborate among research institutions. Um, so another motivation that we have for this work is in the um, medical care domain. Um, so, so we have some people at Harvard working on um, sensors um, to support medical applications. So we, are, for example, extended <coughs> the mode platform to collect the vital signs of patients. And the idea here is that if there's any kind of di um, a disaster happening, um, we would like to be able to um, attach modes to patients then gather all their vital signs and, for example, um, ambulance workers could then um, generate a list of um, the top 10 critical patients at a disaster site and focus their attention on that. And this again requires an infrastructure that once the data is off the sensor network then performs custom processing, perhaps um, combines this data with um, patient records from hospitals or looks at the bad availability at certain hospitals and depending on that makes then um, data dissemination decisions. So, um, so if you think about those two applications, the characteristics here is that it's all about streaming real-time data. Um, there are a lot of heterogeneous data sources that are also geographically distributed. And ideally, we would like to leverage in-network resources for the processing of the data. Because if we have to stream the data over a wide area network, the data already has to travel Along, along a particular path. And if we have any computational resources available there, it would make sense to just take advantage of them. Um, so the kind of model that we have for our infrastructure to support such applications is pretty much that we have um, 
distributed a large number of distributed data producers that could be sensor networks, network monitoring, network monitors, or um, for example, financial markets that generate um, streams. And we have consumers that are also geographically distributed. And they are interested in a subset of those data producers after, after certain types of um, transformations. So they submit continuous queries. Um, so our processing model is that we have um, things called services that then process this type of stream data. And um, the way this problem is tackled these days quite often is that um, all the data from all the data sources that are relevant is streamed to a particular um, centralized processing site. And, and, and there all the processing is trans performed and then it is delivered to the users. Um, but of course this is inefficient if we have multiple users that for example have very similar interests or where the type of processing, where, where a certain amount of processing is shared. So, so what would be nicer in this environment is to, to um, support in-network processing at a finer grain. Um, so, so just to summarize the, the application features here. So we have this large number of distributed data producers we would like to ex export, um, exploit in-network real-time processing of those data streams to aggregate existing resources. And we want to be able to easily deploy um, multiple applications that, that share data producers. So, so, so there's a need for a, a type of reusable and efficient internet infrastructure that does this distributed data collection and processing. Um, so, we call this distributed data structure a stream-based overlay network. And this is, this is our vision for a middleware that allows people to easily build um, random uh, various types of um, um, data processing applications that are then domain-specific. Um, so as I mentioned before, a stream-based overlay network is implemented as an overlay network of processing nodes. And um, so <clears throat> processing nodes, nodes here in this figure are those um, red circles. And each red circle is capable of executing operators on behalf of applications. And, and a problem, of course, that, that needs to be solved here is where to place those services efficiently, depending on the distribution of data producers and data consumers in the system. Um, so the outline of my talk is that I first want to say a bit more about um, a stream-based overlay network <clears throat> and its features, and I'll um, say more about the service placement problem that, uh, that an SBON addresses. And I'll um, introduce our solution to um, service placement, which, which is the relaxation placement algorithm. And um, I will talk about the individual features of that algorithm and um, which is um, a cost space. So this is a technique how, um, how we deal with the, with the um, scale of this problem. And I'll talk about the, the, the two steps that the algorithm performs. I will then um, talk about our evaluation where we um, simulated the efficiency of that placement algorithm in a stream-based overlay network. And we also um, have now some initial results from a deployment on Planet Lab. Um, I will then also briefly talk about my other work that I did as part of my PhD, which was on um, event-based published subscribe middleware. And I will try to show how this ties in with this work. And it's, it's um, sort of um, at, a, a different, at, at, the diff, at a different end of the same spectrum. Um, so I'll talk about um, the published subscribe middleware that I implemented called Hermes and about the detection of um, event patterns um, in a published subscribe middleware. And I'll finish with some future work and, and some conclusions. Um, so as I mentioned, a stream-based overlay network is essentially an, a network abstraction layer that makes it easier to build data stream applications. And it, is, it, it has two components. So an SBON has um, what we call circuits, which are pretty much um, tree-based continuous queries that tie in multiple um, data producers with services and, and, and one consumer. The <clears throat> services are managed by the SBON, but they are under the control of the application. So that means that the SBON doesn't need to know about the semantics of those services 
and it doesn't need to make any assumptions about the data model of the data that is actually transported over a circuit. So as far as the s is concerned, a circuit just um, transmits a stream of bytes, but it doesn't know any, 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 any of the actual semantics. Um, so examples for, for um, services are, for example, traditional continuous query database operators. So things like aggregate, union, join, and so on. But they can also be any type of custom operators that are domain specific. So, so um, say if you have um, um, uh, some kind of sensor network deployment, you first want to perform certain types of um, signal processing or um, fast Fourier transform or any type of um, processing that is, for example, not that cannot be captured in a relational model. Um, if you have a system that um, monitors the health of a network and tries to to detect network intrusion, a custom service could be, for example, um, a service that looks for net for anomalies in in um, connection patterns, say. Um, why, do you, why do you immediately exclude something about the semantics of the data? Well, the reason is because um, once we make assumptions about the semantics of the data, we tie our, our S-bond down to particular types of applications. So for certain applications, say, a relation model is very natural and, 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 and is, is very suitable, but that means that for other applications, that would be a bad model. And the same is true, for example, with semi-structured XML data. It might work well for certain applications, but not for others. Okay, that's your position. I, I think a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. My experience shows that semantics is a big point, good source mm -hmm. for doing more optimization than what you can do on a right. level. Right, right, right. I mean, it's, it's okay. yeah, okay. I mean, we can talk about this later once I've presented more of this. Yeah, please. I think I would just do a follow on. I think mm -hmm. there's some interesting trade off here in terms of what you expose to the uh, network service. And that yeah. is, uh, if you know more about yeah. the data source and also what is the intent for, and also in terms of what uncertainties the data contain, yeah. you can optimize a whole lot more in terms of uh, the high level detection yeah. and uh, in other sensor processing services. Yeah. You mentioned the sensor fusion as one example, which it's actually quite a semantics breach. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, this is this is certainly something that we've realized. And once I talk about future work, it's one thing that we want to investigate is how we can expose some of the semantics in a controlled way through interfaces to to enable richer types of optimizations. But it turns out that when we looked at this service placement problem and we looked at what kind of knowledge of the services do we need to have to efficiently place them, it it turns out that. We need to know about, say, the selectivity of the service, but we don't necessarily need to know about the, the data semantics. Um, okay, so, so the service problem is, is, is very simple. If a consumer submits um, a circuit that looks like this, the location of the producers and the consumer is usually fixed, um, predefined, but, um, but um, the processing service can be placed potentially on any of the overlay nodes. And, and of course, each placement has costs associated with it. And it pretty much ends up being an optimization placement, which you can't just solve globally because there's a large number of nodes and you don't know the actual costs. The costs are, say, network costs. I will, I will talk about the costs more on, on, on the next slide. But um, things like network costs actually re require you to actively probe the network. So, so just considering all possible um, um, locations in an exhaustive search would be would be um, too expensive. So, so what are the types of um, service placement costs that we consider? Well, if you think about the um, costs, there are, there are essentially two classes of costs. So there are application-centric costs, which are the things that the application or the consumer cares about. So when you execute a circuit in an s the application may um, care about the latency. Of, of that the data experiences while it's traveling through the overlay network or the jitter or the available bandwidth. Um, but there are also um, global costs that affect the entire system. So for example, how efficiently do we use the network? So how much network utilization do we, do we um, generate? Or do we create any contention in the system because all the data is flowing through, through certain hotspots? So, so what our goal with our service placement strategy is, is that we want to reduce the latency, but at the same time, we want to minimize the effect of a query on others. So we want to keep the network utilization for a um, query as low as possible. And of course, network utilization is something that cannot be measured directly if you don't know the exact topology 
Um, so we define, so what we want to, so the entity we want to minimize is the amount of in-flight traffic that we put into the network. And um, so we can calculate the amount of in-flight traffic if we just look at the product of the data rate we're streaming through um, the network times um, the latency that this data experiences. And the reason why we think that this is a good um, cost metric is that we have, it, it follows the assumption that high latency network links are more costly to use than low latency ones. So if you, for example, stream a large amount of data through your local area network, that is cheap to operate and you're probably in control with it. But if you're using a wide area network link that traverses a large geographic instance, that is probably more expensive to, to, to operate. So if you can execute a query but avoid this kind of link, that is a good thing. And the other reason for high latency may be network congestion. So a link can experience a high latency because it is congested. And again, if you can avoid such a link, that is also um, um, a, a good thing in the global sense for the entire system. Do you consider load balancing in that? Sorry? Load balance. Well, load balancing, yeah, I will mention something about that, about that later. So, so we definitely look at load as, 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 a, as another factor. But primarily, we're driven by, by those, those two metrics. And then we sort of show that we can add a load balancing scheme on top of that so that we don't, we, we don't do um, things too, too badly in that respect. So you say something about the network. Will you say also something about what you assume about the loads? Or are all nodes the same, the same processing capability? Right, right. I mean, yeah, so far we've just assumed yes. So, so yeah, yeah. So, so we assume that these are PC class machines. So as I mentioned, we ran our prototype on, on Planet Lab and we sort of have this kind of assumption. We haven't got a very good model of the computational cost of those services. And that seems to be important in that mm -hmm. kind of environment you are describing because your little sensors might have a little bit of compute power. Right, right. Only the, I don't know, PC sitting on some of these desks. Right, before, right. So there are differences. No, sure, sure. But, but as far as the stream-based overlay network is concerned, I mean, the, the sensor network is outside of that model. The sensor network just oh, acts as a data producer. So we're not saying that we're pushing some of the operators onto the sensor network. This is a natural extension to consider it as an optimization problem across the entire range because the sensor network can also perform processing. But, but in, in, in this particular work, we've restricted our attention to the, in, in the internet-based infrastructure. Okay, so if we have um, these types of placement costs, then for any type of placement, we can then easily calculate um, um, the, the cost because we know that we can measure the data rate that is being streamed over a particular connection and we, we can measure the latency of, of a link between a producer say and, and a service and we can then calculate the cost of this particular placement and, it then be, uh, and the problem then becomes to find the placement that gives the, the, the lowest cost. Um, so the algorithm that we propose to do this is called relaxation placement. And it is based on the idea that we, it is very difficult to solve this problem in the real world because we don't have global knowledge of all the costs and we cannot probe all the costs. So what we instead do, we build a metric, what we call a cost space. And we try to find a good placement in this metric cost space. And after that, we take um, this placement solution um, that we found in the cost space in the virtual placement phase and we map this back to the physical world to an actual node that exists. So, so it turns out by solving the problem in the cost space it is much cheaper to find a good solution and then um, we also provide a cheap way to map that solution back to the physical, to the physical space. And I will talk about both of those phases in, in more detail now. May I ask you for a yeah. small thing? Sure. I haven't fully understood exactly mm -hmm. what problem you want to solve. Given a network mm -hmm. and given one query or n queries? Given n queries, yeah. N queries. Well, what I will do, of course, is... So, okay, so given a network, use a submit query. For each, each query, I have to instantiate in the network. So for, each, for all of the operators that I can freely place on any of the overlay node in a given query, I have to find a good placement. Okay, and you assume that the query is represented like an algebra tree. Pretty much, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So then I... Any part of the problem, do you specify the 
inputs and outputs of that operator in the sense that if you give me two five megabit per second streams, then I know that I can always reduce it to 100 kilobit per second. Yes, stream. yes. So, so, so the, yeah, the kind of model that we have is that either the operator exports the selectivity that it has to the s bond so the s bond can find out the selectivity of that operator is, you know, 0 0.4, or we can actually measure um, the, the, the data rate on a link dynamically and, and adapt to it as it changes. So you said n queries, but uh, you're treating them individually one, one by one. Right. I will, I will briefly mention, later on mention this one extension of that scheme is that we can reuse um, services across queries, and the placement pretty much is unchanged by that. Because if you think about it, if, say, there's another consumer here that is interested in exactly the same data, well, it can just stream the data off here, and this might affect the placement of this service. But, but the scheme full, uh, also supports that. And I will, I will talk about this um, um, later. Okay, okay so let, let me talk about those two, fa well, first introduce what a cost space is and then um, how we use it to solve this placement problem. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that a cost space is a metric space that encodes the costs for placement decisions. And it has the property that if you take two points in the cost space, then the Euclidean distance between those two points is a measure for the cost of routing a stream between those two, um, those two nodes. Okay. So, so if we look at this um, type of example here, so this is a um, latency space. So here the cost is just the communication latency that you experience. So now um, every node can calculate um, a network coordinate and then form this, this cost space. And the distance between two network coordinates is the communication latency between two nodes. Um, and so there are um, decentralized ways to calculate such a um, cost space for latency, um, which, so for example, there exists the Vivaldi algorithm that, that was recently proposed um, that um, allows um, a large number of nodes to determine their latency space coordinate through a decentralized computation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, metric space required this uh, tri triangular uh, relationship. Right, uh, right. Uh, is it always true in, yeah. in networks? Right, I mean, of course not. So, so the thing about um, the internet is, yeah, that the, the triangulation inequality is, is violated a lot. But it turns out that um, even though it is violated to a, to a certain degree, if you pick about a five or six dimensional space, it turns out that you can still build a metric space that gives you um, latency prediction with a relatively small error. So I think if you look at the Vivaldi paper, I think the, the error that they determined is around 12% for a planet lab-like topology. So this is certainly an appro approximation and you introduce an error, but it turns out that the error is, 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 is definitely small enough to, 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 to um, cope with. Also assume that latency values are then fixed. No, uh, we don't. Um, so I've just mentioned that we first construct the latency space, but during the lifetime of that space, of course, the latency value, values will change. So the cost space in itself will also change slightly, and this might affect our, our, our placement decisions. But this will then trigger the migration of operators. Okay, um, so a latency space is just one example of a very um, simple cost space that we can, we can build. Um, so, so just as a visualization here, so this is a three-dimensional latency space built out of a um, transit stub topology. Um, so, so what you can see here, you can clearly distinguish the stub domains that are at the edges of this picture and the transit domains which are in the center. And, and if, if you think about this, this, this makes sense because all the traffic has to go through the transit domains. So the transit domains are close to everybody, but some of the stop domains will be far away from each other. This is why they're pushed to the edges. So um, just going back to the, to the idea of a cost space, um, so a latency space is just one particular example, but there are other dimensions that we can add to the cost space to also encode other types of costs. So communication latency is one, and for example, um, jitter and bandwidth would be other types of um, vector costs that we want to that we might want to capture in the cost space. 
Um, but there are also scalar costs, things like the load on a particular node or the available memory. So, that, so it might be bad to place a particular service at a node that has a very high load or a very high variability in that load. So, so, we, so what we want to do is also include those other costs in the cost basis additional dimensions. And I will, I will show in a second how, what, what, what this looks like. Um, but let me, let me first summarize the advantages of a cost space, and they are that we now have this mathematical space that we can use to find a good placement and calculate a good placement. Um, there are decentralized and scalable implementations for cost spaces, and it turns out that the maintenance overhead for a cost space is also not that large for a dynamic system. And, um, yeah, and I mentioned that the cost space can also adapt to changing network conditions because nodes continuously update their location in the cost space. And if certain, if, if certain of their properties change, they, their, their position in the cost space will also change. Okay, um, so the cost space that we use for all, for all our um, experiments is a um, latency load space. So what we did is that we have a couple of latency dimensions that capture the communication cost, but we also have one dimension that includes the load of a node. So, so, so here in this example, you see this um, node A over there that's very far away from all the other nodes because it has a very high load. So as far as the placement decision is concerned, this is not an attractive node um, to use. You're using a Euclidean metric over that. So Sorry? Euclidean metric over that space? Yes, we're using a Euclid. Two highly loaded nodes are close to one another. Right, but okay, it, it turns out that when you're, when you're doing your placement, you of course want to find a node that has the lowest possible load. So you pretty much stay in that latency plane. And only after you, you have to map it to an existing node, then you consider the load dimension and you actually look for, the, for, 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 for a real node and you pick the one that is either very close to you or has a very low load. And I'll, I'll show it on the next picture. Okay, but let, let, me, let me first um, explain how you find um, a good location in the cost space. So um, the way we, we do this is we use a... Um, we, we model circuits in that cost space as a network of springs. So this is how we solve the, the optimization problem. So we just say, say that the extension of the spring is the latency of the circuit, um, of a circuit link, and um, the spring constant is um, the data rate that we're sending um, through that circuit link. And then we let the system relax, and of course um, a network of springs will try to minimize um, uh, minimize its energy state, and if you, if you do the appropriate substitutions, what it's actually um, minimizing is what we've earlier on defined as network usage, which is the product of, um, um, of the data rate times the latency, so the, the amount of in-flight data. There's a square term. Yeah, there's, there's the square term in here, and this is, um, and, and the square term just comes from the fact that um, springs, of course, also, so if you, if you think about a simple um, spring system with a single fixed point, a service, and another fixed point, the spring will, of course, prefer to stay in the center between those, those, two, um, um, those two fixed points. So there's always a unique solution for the spring service. Because, but if you think about network utilization, it doesn't really care whether well, network utilization would be the same, ir ir disregarding of where you put that service if its selectivity is one. So, so it turns out that we prefer certain solutions to other that are equivalent in terms of network, network usage. Okay, so yeah, so, so um, again this advantage of, of using this kind of spring model to find a, um, a good placement location in the cost space is that we can do this in an entirely decentralized way. So, um, so if, if um, this service here wants to update its, co its um, coordinate in the cost space. All it needs to know are the coordinates of um, the producers and the consumers that are fixed. And um, by, by, by doing that and um, its current latency to them and the data rates, and by that it can then update its location and, um, and, and relax itself to find, to find the minimum energy state. 
but that might impact other nodes. It, exactly, it might impact other nodes. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is certainly something that where, for example, um, dampening is important. And the other thing is that if you then, for example, network um, conditions change and you might consider a migration, you should always also be aware of the cost of that migration and the impact on other nodes. Yes. So, um, mm -hmm. so in this analogy, when in what situation where your your system would be stiff, meaning that uh, you would have very stiff uh, spring constant, such that it's difficult to relax into the global optimum. If you you mean stable, no? Yeah? It stabilizes. Or? I mean, this is a apparatus to find the minimum solution using relaxation. Yeah. And uh, a lot of these local methods has a problem getting stuck into the global. I mean, into the local minimum. Right. Right. For situations where you have a very stiff system, meaning that oh. if you make a small changes, yeah. the actual utility change quite a bit. Yeah. And in yeah. this analogy, that typically has to do with spring. That the spring is very stiff, meaning if you apply a lot of force, it doesn't do that much. And I wonder, right, right, in a situation where you run experiments, mm -hmm. it's actually quite stiff and it doesn't give you as a global optimal. Yeah. We, we didn't, so, so one thing that we didn't observe that local minima are a problem. So the way, so we've simulated the system with different types of um, transit stop topologies and a, and a planet lab like topology and we deployed it on planet lab and in none of those cases we actually saw that local minima were a problem that the system ended up in a, in a bad state. And, I, and I, I mean this is certainly something that, so we are still working on a better understanding of the exact convergence properties of this. But, but we have the feeling that the way the topologies work mean that it's not likely that we end up in, 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 in local minima. But yeah, but this is definitely a, a concern. I had a much simpler question. Mm -hmm. uh, are you sure that the system doesn't oscillate, meaning it reaches mm -hmm. a, an equilibrium at some point in time? It does, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we certainly have, um, yeah, so, so we have empiric, empirical results where we can show that with a certain number of nodes on Planet Lab, the system will eventually Reach, reach a stable state and then any kind of perturbations after that reflect changes in the actual network properties. But that's probably only true for basic graphs or maybe tree in particular. If you have feedbacks, it's easy to oscillate. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. I mean, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we definitely have this type of dampening mechanism that we consider the cost of a migration. And we only migrate if we believe that the saving that we get in network usage is, is worth the cost of the, of, of, of the migration of an operator. So the migration cost actually serves in this kind of stiffness probably? Well, it, yeah, because it discourages, yeah. Okay. Um, right. Um, so, so this is the vir virtual placement um, stage where we find a good placement in the cost space. So now we have a, we calculated a cost space coordinate of where we would like to place that service, but now we still need to map it to an actual physical node. And, and this com comes back to the earlier question of how load factors into this. So if we think about the latency and load cost space, and um, we first perform the placement in purely the latency space here, because ideally we would like to end up at a node that has a load that is as low as possible. But then when, so we find, a part, so if, if this is a two-dimensional latency space, we find a particular placement in this plane. But now we have to map that back to a physical node. And now we consider the Euclidean distance to all the actual nodes that exist here. So for example, um, say, say in this example we have two possibilities, node N2 and node N1. And even though node N1 is closer in the latency space, it has a far higher load. So the Euclidean distance actually makes it further away than N2. So we pick N2 for the placement because of the lower load. So of course this assumes that there's this um, trade-off that you can make between communication latency and load. And, and we sort of capture it by the fact that load is weighted with some kind of function that, that people decide on. Okay, so you're always computing the, um, when you compute the Euclidean distance, it's always from the projection of the Yes, plane. yes, exactly, okay. exactly. That makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so of course, um, well, a problem that you have here, you have to find the closest node. And how do you, how do you find the closest node? 
so um, to do this in, an, in a scalable way, we use um, a DHT. So what, what each node does, and this is how we actually create the cost space in some sense, is that each node stores um, its um, cost space coordinate in a DHT, and then we rely on DHT routing properties to find the closest existing coordinate to a coordinate that we look up in the DHT. Okay, so we essentially do a range query over the DHT. Um, and um, so, so one additional complication is that cost space coordinates are n-dimensional, but DHT keys have to be one-dimensional. So we need to map n-dimensional um, cost space coordinates into one-dimensional um, DHT keys. And for that, we use um, space-filling Hilbert curves, which, which are a technique that um, um, a number of people suggested to, to store multi-dimensional um, data in a one-dimensional DHT. Why did you fix yourself on the Hilbert curve then? Sorry? Why did you fix yourself on the Hilbert curve? <laughs> it was just the, the simplest thing to try, pretty much. I mean, there are definitely, so, so this is another thing, actually. Um, so um, when I went to um, NSDI earlier this week, we, we presented some, um, a, a poster that had an evaluation of the error introduced by the Hilbert curve. And it turns out there are quite a lot of interesting, interesting properties. And Hilbert curves have those un this unfortunate property that if you, they have a very high error along one axis here. So, so here essentially, well, because you have to go all the way around, um, those two points actually close in space, but really far away on the Hilbert curve. And if you're unlucky, and the Hilbert curve um, lies, well, lies um, very badly aligned in the cost space, this might actually introduce a large error in certain, in certain areas. So yeah. But you have this with other space filling curves as well? Pretty much, yeah. So, yeah. Why not use like a mid-mapper or something that, you know, that actually puts 2D things close together in 2D space? Sorry? So, so why not use a structure that actually reflects the two-dimensional structure of the data? I mean, it seems like you're kind of doomed here. Because right. I mean, well, the, the data is not two-dimensional, right? I mean, the data is n-dimensional. I mean, usually we look at five, five dimensions or something like that. So what we need to have is a lookup service where we can find the closest existing n-dimensional point to a particular coordinate. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a well-known database problem, and, and so there are definitely other ways of doing it, and it, it sort of wasn't the focus of this, this work. Well, yeah. it seems as you get to these higher dimensions, the distance in Hilbert curve space is going to be almost completely unrelated to the... Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, this is... But this is true for any other space filling curve as well. Yeah, this is well, right. which makes you wonder whether it's a good solution. Well, that, that can only say, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, this is another thing that, yeah, we, we looked at the properties of, of, of higher dimensional spaces, and, and it's exactly as you said, that the higher um, the dimensions, the, 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 the weaker the correlation is. So, I mean, it is the thing that we tried because other people suggested. I mean, there are at least four or five different papers that suggest this technique, and I, and I had the impression that no one actually really tried to do it. And, but anyway. Um, okay, so, so, so now we have the scheme that allows us to... Um, to place um, a single query, so a single circuit, efficiently in the, in, in, in the stream-based overlay network. And what I've briefly mentioned earlier on, that this also generalizes to multi-query optimization and, and more complex types of optimization. So the, I, I, so the idea that we have with this is that you can, you can use the cost space to um, guide your search when you want to provide any type of large-scale large scale query optimization. So whatever transformation, so you create a new circuit and whatever types of optimizations you, you want to perform, you probably only want to involve services that are close in the cost space to you. Because if there's a service that is really far away, then probably the communication cost is so prohibitively large that there is no point of performing any additional optimization with that. And, and one simple example to illustrate that is um, finding reusable services, um, existing reusable services for new queries. So if, if there's already a service in the system that does the type of processing that, the, that you're doing, then it makes sense to reuse that to, to save on processing and network resources. And, and um, here again, you can use the cost space to, to guide the search and only consider services that are in, in, in a particular um, sphere around you and only consider those for, for, um, for, for reuse. So here we have a bunch of circuits that are set up with um, certain operators, A, B, C, D, and then a user comes and creates a new, um, uh, a new query here, 
but it turns out that this service is exactly the same as this service over here because it is the same type and it uses the same inputs. So what makes sense is to reuse that service and we can then consider a particular radius around the virtual placement of the new circuit, of, of the new service and then only search through that space to find any nodes that are running services that are compatible. And, and this is a way for us to um, put a bound on, on, on the effort that we do when we look um, for services. So here in this example, we would then find that service and we can then um, reuse that. And, 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 yeah, and we essentially perform multi-query optimization. And we can use, sorry? Yeah, and um, so the thing that can happen here is of course, if you think about how relaxation placement works, this could affect the placement of that service. Yeah. So, so this, this might lead that service to migrate because now there is another consumer that wants to get the data here, so it probably makes more sense to aggregate it somewhere, somewhere closer to that consumer. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, so, so we've el evaluated this um, in, in simulation and on Planet Lab, um, so I only briefly want to talk about the um, about the um, evaluation of, of this. But we ran yeah experiments in a discrete event simulator. We used the Georgia Tech transit stop topology, and in all of those experiments, we created a thousand simple circuits that had a structure like this with four producers, one aggregation service, and one consumer. And then we looked at um, the network usage of our placement strategy in comparison to other algorithms that are described briefly. And we also looked at the latency behavior of this and whether we create any resource contention in the system. Um, so we compared relaxation placement to five other placement algorithms. And the five algorithms were um, optimal placement where we actually, well, because this was everything in simulation, we could perform um, an exhaustive search for the best possible placement in the system um, for comparison. Um, we looked at IP multicast placement, which always places um, services where IP multicast would put IP multicast routers. So that assumes that you know about the um, actual um, uh, network topology so that you can figure out where, where IP, IP, IP multicast routers are placed. Um, producer placement always places um, the service at one of the producer nodes. Consumer placement is, is equivalent to, to a um, centralized data warehouse where you always place the service at the consumer, and random just picks a random node. Um, so, yeah, so if you look at the um, at network utilization, so what this plot shows here is the um, CDF of um, network usage. Um, so we have the bandwidth latency product, which is the amount of in-flight data on the x-axis, and if you, and this is uh, um, the distribution of network usage costs after placing a thousand circuits in our um, transit stop topology. So as expected, optimal placement finds the best placement solution because it does this infeasible exhaustive search, but then relaxation placement is, manages to be very close to a go good solution, even though it introduces this error because first go into the cost space and then map back into the, into the physical space. Um, and yeah, and all the other schemes then, then, then perform, perform worse. Um, so another thing that we looked at is the delay penalty that the application has to, has to pay. So how do we affect the latency of the data? And um, so we looked at the delay stretch, which is yeah, the, the, the ratio between the, best possible, the lowest possible delay um, and, and, and the one that we are getting. So of course the lowest delay um, you get if you look at um, consumer placement because then you don't do any in-network processing of the data, but the data travels on the shortest IP routing path to the consumer. So ideally, this, this is supposed to give you the lowest delay in the system. And, and because IP multicast also places multicast routers only on the IP routing path, well, if you, if you don't think about the network um, processing delay, which we didn't, uh, didn't um, model here, um, that doesn't um, introduce any, any further penalty. Um, so it turns out that um, relaxation placement also gives you, well, there is certainly a certain um, penalty because of poor placement decisions, um, but it is, it is actually um, fairly low. And what is an interesting observation that for our particular topology, in a small fraction of the cases, we actually managed to find a better placement than the IP routing path. 
um, because so we used the transit stop to, the draw detect transit stop topology and we calculated um, the IP routing tables for that topology in a very similar way um, to how it's done on the internet that we first route to the correct AS and then we route within that autonomous system but it, relaxation placement then manages in some cases to find a better route by, by, not, fo by not following this. I have a small question yep. again. Are you assuming that you are bound in some way on, on the bandwidth? Because when you send everything to the consumer, yeah. you are sending an That's enormous amount of data exactly. that will flood the system. Right. So actually, it must also add something to the delay. Right, right. This is something that we did not model in the, in, in the simulation. But you're perfectly right. That we, yeah, so since we didn't model any effect of, of bandwidth, we just assumed that the links are well provisioned. Um, that, that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's not modeled by a simulator, but that is definitely a valid, valid point. It seems like, if anything, that deficiency would, like, if you taken that into account, it would have skewed the results more in its favor. No. Right? No. The more you put, put the, data, uh, the, the data processing nodes closer to the producers, the more likely it is that you might not always produce less data, and therefore you have less data to stream. Right, but in yeah, this, but this scheme right now will, is suffering a penalty for taking a longer path, but it's not reaping the benefit of sending less data yeah. in this analysis. Yes. Yeah. So in some sense, like this is showing the cost, but not the benefit of doing better placement than just sending all the data back to one place. Yeah. yeah. So if you were to take into account right. anything, I think it's right. better. I'm not that towards, but I think that needs a really careful analysis, and I right. think that's where the balance or the trade-off right. is. Right. This is a very network-centric view, mm -hmm. and I think you also have to add on top of that the processing point of view. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, so I, I think one of the motivations for network processing is that in some cases you simply cannot stream all the data to a centralized location because you don't have the network resources. And that is an assumption that we did not make in the, in the simulation or evaluation. Okay, so another thing that we looked at that was the, um, the last simulated experiment is we looked at resource contention. And that is, that is quite interesting because if you think about a transit stop topology as a model of the internet, you have the transit domains that are somewhere in the middle and then you have the, um, the, the stop domains um, at, at the edge. And of course, what happens is the transit domains or the nodes that live close to transit domains are far more popular for service placement if your producers and consumers are randomly distributed because all the data has to travel through them anyway. And it turns out that if you look at the distribution of placement decisions for the optimal placement strategy that does the exhaustive search, it will of course heavily try to place many operators in the transit domains because it, it discovers exactly that fact. And relaxation placement does something similar. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't put that many services there, but you still have this large bias of for, for this particular type of topology that transit domains are, are more popular. And that, that is an interesting observation because if you think about the Planet Lab topology, even Planet Lab has certain nodes that, are, that could be considered part of transit domains because these are nodes that are, for example, at the big internet exchanges. So they are very well connected. A lot of traffic, they, they, have, they experience very low latency to a lot of destinations. And of course, those nodes are then... Um, uh, more suitable for, for, for the placement of services. Um, of course, that is a, not a good solution because those nodes might then get overloaded. So you need to restrict, and this is where, well, yeah, modeling the computational cost comes in. So you need to actually look at the load and spread the load. So if, if, a, service is, if, if a particular node is overloaded, you simply cannot place the service there, and then you pick the, next, uh, the second best alternative in the cost space. It seems to be a function also of the weights that you actually place yes, in yes. front of the loads as yeah. versus the, exactly. the latency exactly. space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was our um, evaluation in a simulator with a transit subtopology. And then we also um, um, finished an, an implementation of an S1 on Planet Lab that uses a load latency space. It supports the dynamic migration of services. And we actually wanted to see how the system dynamically adapts to changes in the cost space and for example what the convergence properties are and so on and we implemented two um, applications to look at that so we have our own simple java application that streams data and performs simple types of um, optimization but then we also took um, borealis which is a stream processing system that is developed by some people at um, at mit and we um, and borealis 
comes with a large number of different operators, so it has a very rich language to express your continuous queries, but it doesn't address the placement problems. Borealis um, requires the system administrator to specify IP addresses of the nodes where the, the, the actual operators in the query are going to be, to be initialized. So just for that reason, it's a very good match with our system because we could just take all the, the rich language that Borealis provides and then combine it with our, with our pla placement approach. Um, yeah, and this little picture here shows um, um, Planet Lab in a latency space. So you see nodes that belong, um, well, roughly to Europe, the East Coast, the West Coast, and, and Asia. So you sort of see how Planet Lab is built up. Um, so the only result I, I want to show for our Planet Lab experiments is essentially um, a comparison of the dynamic adaptation that we've observed. So what we did is we ran an experiment with 24 circuit pairs where um, the pair pairs had a single service and they started out on the same node but one of those services, one of the circuits was free to migrate whereas the other one was fixed at that particular location. And we let the system run for about five hours and then we looked at the efficiency between those circuit paths and we looked whether letting those circuits migrate freely in the system actually improved um, network efficiency. So lowered network usage or or, um, or, or didn't have any, any beneficial effect. And the result is that for 75% um, of the circuits, migration then, then caused a decrease in the, in the network usage, and we had about 17% less network usage after 15 hours because the circuits could dynamically adapt to changes in, say, BGP routes um, and so on. And, and we also observed a lower latency um, by 11%. And yeah, and the circuit migrated on average 3.5 times in that in that period of five hours. Um, right. Okay. So this is this is the current work that we're doing on on, on, on stream-based overlay networks. So before I finish, I would briefly like to at least mention um, the work that I did on um, event-based middleware as part of, from, of of my PhD. And, and I also think that it sort of fits into this, this general framework um, that I'm working on now. So, um, so event-based middleware, well, so one of the assumptions here in, in, for, for stream-based overlay networks was that data has stream semantics and there are data streams that are propagating through the system. But what if the data does not have stream semantics? So what, what if the data produces every now and then just produce an event if something of interest has happened? And then you need to deliver that event to people who are actually um, interested in this, in this occurrence. And the, the crucial difference here is that you suddenly don't have a well-known set of consumers. So previously we knew who the consumers were because these are the people that, that um, submit their, their, their queries. But what if you have an unknown or a very dynamic set of consumers that, that, that changes. And what kind of middleware abstraction do you then provide to efficiently um, distribute all that data? So, so yeah, and one approach to, to solve this problem is to have a middleware that follows the publish-subscribe paradigm where um, event publishers just publish the data into the middleware without really caring about um, who, the, who the interested subscribers are. And then it becomes the responsibility of the publish subscribe system to deliver those um, those events to all the subscribers depending on their interest specifications in form of, of subscriptions. So what I focused on is a scalable implementation of content-based routing of events. And, and so if you, if you compare this to a stream-based overlay network, you could say that this is more of a datagram routing model where you make a routing decision on a per event basis that depends on the set of subscribers that you have in the system compared to the connection-oriented model in the stream-based overlay um, where you set up the, the, the data streams. Um, and, and of course another thing about a middleware abstraction is that you also have to think about um, additional middleware services to make this feasible for programmers to use. So you want to see how can I integrate this cleanly into a programming language? Um, what kind of um, subscription language do I want to um, do I want to provide and also um, how do I deal with reliability and and faults in the overlay network and so on um, so so what I built for my PhD is um, is called Hermes which is a um, distributed event-based middleware 
Um, so it's targeted at the large-scale fine-grained um, um, at, at large-scale fine-grained information dissemination events. And um, so the idea behind it is to build a content-based publish-subscribe system on top of a DHT. And that has certain advantages because it means that the DHT is responsible for the routing of the events and also you can take advantage for any kind of, of any kind of um, fault tolerance mechanisms that the DHT includes to heal paths uh, once nodes have failed. Um, another way in which um, I use the DHT is to define um, rendezvous nodes in the system. So the idea here is that those are well-known no, uh, points in the system where the subscriptions that are submitted by subscribers and the events that are published by publishers can meet in the system. And this is how, we, uh, how, how the routing path for an event for a producer to all interested subscribers is set up. Um, I also worked a bit on programming language integration where um, we had, where events are typed, so they have um, their, their own event type, and um, event types form an inheritance hierarchy that is similar to the kinds of um, um, data models that, um, uh, similar to the types of type systems that you find in object-oriented programming languages. And we experimented a bit with an XML data model with type checking by um, uh, defining um, events as XML um, entities. Um, so then, yeah, I also, also try to extend this architecture with a couple of additional services. So one thing that I want, want to talk briefly about is a um, service to detect composite event patterns. So one of the problems with this is that if you have a large-scale system, you might have a large number of publishers that constantly publish very low-level events that are not necessarily of interest to, um, to, to subscribers. So, so one, one service that is very attractive for this type of middleware is something that allows you to um, submit more expressive, higher-level subscriptions and then um, f uh, detects those, those higher-level composite events whenever they occur. Um, yeah, I also worked on a scheme for congestion control in an overlay network um, because it turns out that normal TCP congestion control mechanisms don't really um, work well once you have multi-hop routing in your system. And I also um, looked at security co considerations and access control models that work well in a scenario where publishers and subscribers are decoupled from, from each other and specifying security policies is harder because of that. Um, yeah, so, so, so um, composite events, um, yeah, so subscribers may be overwhelmed by the large number of low-level events. So we had this little, little um, so we simulated this little um, environment um, of an active office, which is a sensor-rich environment where we have a lot of light sensors, temperature sensors that all generate primitive events. But people are usually interested in, in higher level specifications. So here in, in, in this example, a user, Gene, would like to have a um, PDA record of um, the whiteboard content of all the meetings that she attended. And this whiteboard content should then be sent to her wireless um, PDA. And, and this, this, this kind of um, complex subscription is, is more representative for the type that users want to do. And the primitive events here is you can detect people that are, for example, in a meeting room. You can detect the use of a whiteboard. So you can, you can think how to translate this into, into a lower level specification where you first have to detect that a meeting is going on. You have to make sure that the user gene is part of that meeting, that the whiteboard has been used. And then you get the whiteboard content as, as as, as an event and you want to, to transmit it somewhere else. So, so composite events are, are very similar to, to the way you have database triggers. But because this is a, an event-based middleware, you need some kind of distributed scalable detection mechanisms for, 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 for those events. Um, yeah, so, so um, Yeah, so the idea that we had here is that we wanted to have a scheme where the detectors for composite events have bounded resource usage and where we can easily um, factorize them to distribute, them, to distribute the detection um, along um, different nodes. So we wanted to, um, to have a scheme that gives us the flexibility to distribute the detection itself. And, um, yeah, and, and the way we, we defined our language for specifying those is that we took um, the well-known model of regular expressions in finite state automata 
and we updated those with um, a number of uh, extensions to support um, temporal um, directives. So, so we had to update it to um, be able to um, detect parallel events, um, the timing between, between events and the perimeterization um, bet between, between events. Um, so, so yeah, so that w then we, we can construct those, um, those composite event detectors um, and then we can place them along the routing path of event, event trees. So in some sense, this, this, this has a similar problem to what the stream-based overlay network does because it also deals with the placement of those, of, of, of those operators. But it also knows about how to decompose operators and, and, and so on. Yeah, and um, so the goal here was that the composite event detection automata would be very expressive and can detect arbitrary patterns of events, but users specify um, their interests in higher-level languages that are domain-specific. So for an active office environment, you would have a particular higher-level language that you use to specify the types of interactions that people are interested in, and they are then um, translated into our um, core composite event language, where we can then do things like factorization and distribution of those operators easily and translate them into, into those, those detectors. Okay, um, so, so let me finish with an outlook of, of future work and some conclusions. Um, so, so the work that I've been doing over the past years is, is pretty much has been along the lines of what does the middleware of the future look like? So what kind of middleware architecture do we need to support new large-scale distributed um, applications? And, and so middleware is a very useful abstraction. and um, so in, in um, local area networks, things like um, core bar or um, DCOM made programming very, very um, much, much easier. But those middleware architectures were based on completely different assumptions about failure, about scale, about communication patterns. So the new types of middleware that, that we need um, today are, are quite fundamentally different from, from, from those types. And there aren't really any good, good solutions out there. So, so the two things that I mentioned in this talk, stream-based overlay networks and event-based middle, are essentially two approaches of, of addressing those needs. So stream-based overlay networks try to acknowledge the stream-based char character of, of, of data in stream processing applications, whereas event-based middleware is more targeted at publish-subscribe event, event dissemination and um, yeah, datagram routing. Um, so another interesting question is, um, what kind of programming models will you use for those large-scale um, distributed systems? So once you have a middleware like this, how will this affect the way you, you, um, you, you program those, the, those systems? So, for, so, so one thing that we did when we worked on, on, this, um, composite event, on those composite event detectors, we looked at a graphical tool to compose those um, um, composite event expressions, and then from that graphical tool, we compiled them down into the actual in, into the actual detectors. And um, yeah, in, in a shorter term, stream-based overlay networks. So we've 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 just um, deployed our prototype on on uh, Planet Lab. There's certainly a lot that we want to do. So one thing is, yeah, what was mentioned earlier on is the type of opt uh, interaction between the optimizations that the S1 can perform and the optimizations that the application could perform because it has complete knowledge about the semantics of the data and, and the operators. So, so defining appropriate interfaces to expose some of the semantics to the S1 will allow us to perform new types of optimization. Um, we also would like to look at other metric um, cost spaces, so things that also include bandwidth, jitter, and so on. And, um, yeah, and the way we, we view um, s bonds, we would like to see them as a public service that, say, runs on Planet Lab and allows people to easily deploy their custom um, stream processing applications because they now can um, benefit from this abstraction of setting up circuits and efficiently placing, placing um, services in the network. Um, yeah, so to conclude, um, so yeah, I believe that large-scale data stream applications require new infrastructures. So there's no point that every project starts building something from scratch, um, but it would be good if we had an abstraction that allows us to easily support in-network processing, but then also adapt to um, network dynamics and dynamics in the, in the, in the actual stream. 
and, and I feel that a stream-based overlay network is such an abstraction um, because it can be reused across multiple applications and it tries to factor out the minimum functionality that those applications have to do, which is um, this, the service placement problem. And I've presented um, our approach to solve service placement, which is called relaxation placement, um, that uses um, a cost space to reduce the cost of service placement decision. So by first doing um, the placement in the cost space, then mapping it back, we can still reduce latency and network utilization, so the cost that we're interested in, and we can adapt to, 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 to network, network dynamics. And I briefly also mentioned um, how the scheme can be extended to, um, for, for multi-query optimization. And then, yeah, then I finished um, with um, um, some, some, some words on um, event-based middleware, which is just another type of, of middleware along across, across the spectrum. Okay, that's it, thank you. Any other questions? I would like to make some remarks. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're aware of it. I mean, mm -hmm. when you talked about events, yep. people in the database area talked about active databases yep. 20 years ago. Yep. So they, they, they developed yep. uh, event algebra and yep. so on. Yep. That's this mm -hmm. impact your world. Right, 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 right. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was certainly a starting point when we, when we started looking at this composite event detection. We started out with existing event algebras for active databases. And it turns out that, um, so yes, yeah, so there are a lot of proposals how to detect, well, how to implement event triggers, how to detect them, so based on, on pushdown automata, petri nets, so all sorts of different computational models up to random C code. Um, the problem with those approaches is that they are not easily dis uh, distributable. So, so we wanted a scheme that where we can decompose the expression. And it turns out that if you, if you have something that is based on, on, on our um, finite state automata, you can pretty much split something off along transitions and just implement the transition from one state to another as a message being sent to a remote node. So, well, so there have been some solutions that try to take these event items and more or less develop something like on the un underneath somehow what the user sees more or less an algebra tree that then according right. to the distributed relational database right. distributed. Yeah, network. right, right. I mean, uh, yeah, there, there were definitely some, so yeah, so one of the reasons was that, yeah, I mean, even though there were some approaches, um, a lot of those active database systems were centralized architectures. Yes. The other reason why we ended up um, developing our own language was that we wanted to base our language on uh, uh, some kind of um, minimal complete um, model, whereas a lot of the database um, trigger languages sort of started out having a lot of operators that were quite often also um, um, overlapping in their functionality, but convenient to the users. They didn't necessarily have had this kind of, um, i just go back to that slide, this kind of distinction between a higher level language that is domain specific and then the, the basic atoms that, 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 is, uh, that are actually used to, to perform the detection. Yeah. May I ask another question? Please. Your work seems to be very close to what mm -hmm. people in distributed databases have done over the many years. Right, right. The only distinction I can see is that you look more from a network point of yes. view. Yes. And I'm exaggerating, yeah. ignore the data aspect right. of right. the database. Right. Yeah. From yeah. The database side. yeah, yeah. So isn't it time this point to look at both? It, it certainly is. It certainly is. But I think the truth is really that those two communities have been working on very similar problem without really um, addressing the concerns of the other. So distributed databases are another. So if you look at the work on stream processing system, I mean continuous query systems have been along. Yeah, have been allowed for a long time. But if you look at, is it possible to actually um, distribute those systems across a large number of nodes? The answer is, is probably no, because those systems had more of a limited view of what, what distribution means. And very few of those systems take network costs into account. So, so you are right that I, I have more of a networking distributed systems background, and this is why, why I, I bring this into the equation. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, I went to a workshop at, um, that was associated with ICDE, which, which was called NetDB, Networking Meets Databases. And I think during that workshop, all those 
problems were very evident that there were a lot of common work in both communities on stream uh, query processing. I mean, a lot of the recent peer-to-peer -peer, um, search work is, is very much what database people have been doing, but uh, suddenly the assumptions about scale and failure are quite different from what the network community considered. So, so I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer that those communities should get closer together, but I don't believe that the database community has solved all the problems. No, 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 no. <laughs> Although I must say, Database people have always uh, worried about scalability, not so much on the uh, network side, but on the data side. Right, so, exactly. Again, all yeah. the differences, but yeah. it would be time to merge things together. Right, right, right. No, this is, this is certainly, certainly a good point. And in some sense, I mean, this is one thing that we want to do with the stream-based overlay work and the types of optimization that we do here, that we draw in more of the yeah, data-dependent optimization that, that we could perform. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Um, ich bin also in Norddeutschland aufgewachsen.